Thanks so much. And then I'll go ahead and share my slides. And sorry, so many buttons to press. Okay. And Facebook Live here. Oh. All right, and we are live. Okay, great. So welcome y'all. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, our presentation, so this is our fifth web session on key frameworks for advocacy part one. Um, and this will specifically be around racial justice. We have some amazing presenters for y'all today. Um, I am so excited to introduce them. Um, first, I wanted to go over a quick, um, some quick grounding slides um, and logistics um, before we dig in. Uh, so very quickly um, for folks on the Facebook live stream, uh, this, these web sessions are part of a larger curriculum that we at PWN have planned for both our Health Not Prisons advocates as well as our PWN policy fellows. Um, the Health Not Prisons advocates are advocates um, who are working to decriminalize HIV in various states um, throughout the country. Um, and the project specifically increases meaningful participation um, by communities most harmed by HIV criminalization, by really supporting training and financially resourcing BIPOC people living with HIV. Um, our PWM policy, policy fellows are a group of 10 amazing advocates participating in a year long program designed to support women, trans, and non-binary people living with HIV to gain skills in policy advocacy. Um, we know policies will have better outcomes for our communities when those who are most directly impacted by decisions are making those decisions. Um, so our curriculum is really grounded in gender and racial justice and focuses on increasing knowledge of how policy decisions are made, how we can impact them, and how to advocate for transformation um, to build the world that we actually want to see, which is a world where all women, trans, and non-binary people living with HIV can live long, healthy, and dignified lives free from stigma and discrimination. Um, and so this web session um, has been, uh, is, is a really crucial part of this curriculum that we have, um, and I'm really excited um, to share the learning objectives that we have for y'all today, which are to learn how racial justice and Black liberation intersects with the HIV movement, to learn how to apply a racial justice framework to policy advocacy, and to learn about examples of using a racial justice framework in advocacy. Um, some quick logistics. We are recording and live streaming. Um, please share your name and pronouns and location in the chat if you are comfortable. Um, closed captioning is on, uh, on the Zoom for accessibility purposes. Um, and there are no dumb questions. So our presenters today um, have uh, let us know that y'all should feel free to engage and um, ask questions, raise your hands throughout the presentation. Um, there won't be like a, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for Q&A, but it won't be like a very, but you shouldn't um, have to hold your questions um, throughout the presentation. Feel free to ask them and the presenters will try to, um, you know, uh, answer them in real time as we, as we go through the, the slides. Um, this is a space to learn together um, and again, ask questions and um, feel free um, to raise your hand. Uh, so with that, I'm very, very excited to, to introduce our really amazing presenters today. Um, we have Vanita Ray. Can we give it like a big round of applause for Vanita who's joining us today? We're so grateful and lucky to have her in the, our space um, today with us and in community with us today. Um, Vanita uses she, her pronoun, AIA pronouns. She's the coordinator for Black South Rising and she's a PWN member and of course our former um, PWN co-executive director. So we're just so grateful um, to have her in the space with us today. Um, and then we have Max, a huge round of applause, um, please for Max. Uh, we are just, again, I mean, so honored and 
Um, I was just on early today with Benita and she has just sung his praises so much and I'm just so excited um, to have him here with us today. Max uses he, him pronouns. He's a member of the HIV Racial Justice Now um, organization and we're just so, um, again, honored to have him um, share his knowledge and insights with us today. Um, and so I'm just with that, I, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Benita and Max because I know y'all will be in amazing hands. Um, and I'll go ahead and pass it to Benita. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. You know, I uh, really, y'all, I feel just as honored to be here as y'all to have me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm a PWN member first. I could have put a lot of other things on that slide deck, but everything I do now is is uh, around uplifting the voices of uh, people living with HIV, or around um, talking about you know racial justice and using it as a framework for any of the work that we do in social justice movements. So it's a real honor to be here. Um, I was telling Max earlier that it's because of him I even created a presentation about why Black women are so disproportionately impacted, and it was what the beginning of what led me to the analysis that we have today around racial justice, white supremacy culture, and how we you know. Uh, do that within the HIV movement and other social justice movements. So please ask questions. We don't have all the answers and you all probably have some, but what's more important is this is really your space. We got a lot of information, but if if, if it isn't being presented or we haven't asked the ask, answered the question, it does you no good. So this is your space, especially for you all who are the uh, fellows and the HMP advocates, please ask questions. So before we get started, next slide. And some of you have already seen this and, and you should know there's gonna be some poll questions uh, interlaced between this and some other ways that you all can talk, but we're gonna just start off with some quick definitions and um, not gonna spend a lot of time. I know you all will have, get this slide deck but around race and racism, white supremacy, anti-blackness, these a lot of these terms we hear all the time. I know when I first started hearing anti-blackness, I really didn't understand what it meant. But I, I think for this presentation, some of the biggest things for you all to really get is that race, even though you know, we know America focus around it so much and you cannot see me without seeing who I am, the race or the color I am. You should know that it was a social construct. We didn't, uh, in the evolution of man or however you believe this started, somebody said black people here, brown people there and stuff, we were people. And someone came up with the idea that white folks should be here and everybody else, underneath. That's called a social construct. Someone created this ideas of race and who should be on top or bottom to benefit themselves. And, and the people who created that were people that were not folks of color. So just know races goes throughout everything we do, but it, it didn't evolve naturally. It was created to benefit one group of people over a, a bunch of other groups of people. Right. Racism, I just want y'all to know racism is about power plus prejudice. And I, before folks say something, I'm talking power with the big P. So I'm not, I don't believe black folks, brown folks, Asian folks have no power, but I call these two different powers. We have what I'm going to call power with the little P for our purposes. And then there's power with the big P. The power with the big P plus prejudice is what constitutes racism. And that means if you've had a court that had that has had to decide your rights, <laughs> you know, um, the idea of race and who's on top says we already got our rights. If you're white like or closest to white and the rest of y'all, we're going to decide, you know, or someone else is going to decide. Um, so you need that power with the big P because I can be prejudiced against anyone, but not stop them from getting that job over there, right? Systemically, I might be the boss today, but as a whole, can I stop them from doing something they want to do because I don't like who they are? Or can I take away their rights to do something? That's the power with the big P. That's why reverse racism doesn't exist. 
because we have the power with the little p plus prejudice. There's no such thing as reverse racism. People want to say that because we don't want to have to share power <laughs> with others. White supremacy, I know you all have seen it. Please, you can feel free to be putting stuff in the chat, but it's just a system. Or And this is what we mostly are fighting against, white supremacy culture, something that I call the matrix. It is everywhere and nowhere. You know, you're in it. I'm a matrix fan. So you're in it just by breathing. I don't care who you are, white supremacy culture. And is that dominant culture who has decided what we all should be measured by, what we all should have to uh, uh, um, uh, achieve. And it's the their systems, I see that MJ, them systems, that's why we talk about systemic stuff because it is baked in our structures, our systems and our institutions. If you go look at the 13th amendment, it said everybody is free, which is what really freed the slaves and not the Emancipation Proclamation, except if you are a criminal. So what do we get from there is the criminal justice system that there's more black folks in there so that we can still get free labor. So it's a system or a set of systems that perpetuates and maintains the social, political, historical, or institutional domination by white people or light people where you, know, you might go to a country and say, oh, they don't have racism. Well, I guarantee you there's some level of colorism going on that lighter people are attributed higher status. So anti-blackness, how many of y'all have heard of anti-blackness? Max, do you want to come off mute and talk about anti-blackness? Just briefly, if not, I'll keep going. But So it's at the root of everything that we experience as Black people, of imperialism and, and I, now I say, I don't even use words that say the black sheep. Every, it's the negative, it is the negative connotation associated with blackness, okay? Anti-black racism is what happens when folks, you know, use that power plus privilege to impact and, and decide and be racist and decide people's rights or abilities to live freely and liberty. And in our country, things are associated negative with blackness, the black sheep. You could tell a white lie, but you can't, I guess a black lie ain't the same as a white lie. It's minimizing everything or maximizing the negativity associated with blackness or anything that's not um, uh, next to whiteness. So, and it's at the core of everything. It has justified police killing men because I saw blackness and I was scared for my life. So that justified my taking his life because black is fearful. Anti-blackness is everywhere, y'all. Microaggressions, some people would say there's no such thing. I'm only mentioning this because they're the way we verbally give, throw shade at people. Oh, you speak well for your race. You're a pretty or trans woman. You know, it might be, phrased as a compliment, but it's shade for days, y'all. And some folks don't call them micro because they add up when you experience and hear these microaggressions every day. I call them little murders. You know, folks could say things. My grandson just got his degree and went for a job and he didn't get it. And they wrote in his in, in the email said, wow, you're very articulate and well-spoken. We were so impressed and his feelings were so hurt because he thought, well, of course I am. And then colonial, so microaggressions happen. You've experienced them. You might've thrown the shade at somebody like, oh, she looked good for this or that, or you speak well for an immigrant, but it is, it is not a compliment. It is shade for days. And colonialism and imperialism, I want you all to think about is this practice that folks did when they, they made the decision it's the reason why Haiti speaks French is because these, these white like uh, uh, countries divided up black countries and we went and invaded them, whether for the purpose of religion, saving them. That's why we've got all these different, um, these different languages all over Africa. Either colonialism is a person, people who have thought they were probably better, who went out and took over places and colonized them, thought they were bringing civilization or religion to, to a community of people. And it really resulted in their control over that people. 
by and using standards that they have in measurement of them. That's why Africans were thought of as being uh, savages or beasts because we didn't dress, wear, or use the same language as the folks who came, our colonizers. So when you see different languages around the world, uh, sometimes they are there as a result of colonialism. Um, Max, anything you'd add to what I just said? I'm gonna keep going if he's not, he might be somewhere he can't talk or he's having a problem. So next slide. So any questions about, oh yeah, let me finish this one first. And so racism, I wanna get you all in tune. Everybody think, you know, there's four levels of racism and this is from Race Ford. You can look up their website. They have a lot of information um, um, on their website around this, but four levels of racism. And I want y'all to think about this because Max and I are gonna really focus on structural and institutional, which is what we, we think of when we're talking systemic and structural barriers. If there's internalized, you know, that's our own individual beliefs of, of other people, interpersonal, how I people relate to each other, right? You know, if I got to have a relationship with someone that I work with who, who might think all Black people are this or that, you know, that interpersonal, but the institution and the structural, and let me not minimize the, the individual and the interpersonal, they are very dangerous. You know, you run into somebody in the wrong place, like we saw the man in Birmingham, Alabama, trying to do his job and folks decided no. But the institutional and the structural, you all, are the deepest and what Max and I and others when are talking about when we're talking about systemic. The institutional is, is those inequitable kinds of uh, policies and practices from the criminal justice institution, from the education institution, from different institutions where, like I told you, white supremacy culture and anti-Blackness is baked in. And so those institutions who perpetuate racism or other inequities, which could be homophobia, transphobia, but it's at the institutional level. So that's bigger than what an individual would do, because if I go here to get my health care and folks don't like me, you've affected me in a bigger way. But you've taken your internalized or you've taken your individual and then you've now brought it into an institution. And then the structural is the accumulation of all of this, the structural uh, racism and in institution that it is baked in into our institutions, into our culture, into our hiring practices, into the way we think about who's the poor people. If I told you that there was more white folks receiving welfare than black folks, you might not believe me because Social Security, SSI is in that list and there are. But the, the, the kind of racism and bias that's baked in systems make it seem like we're the problems. Or, and I'm not just saying black folks, but any marginalized group of people, but institutional and structural are the kind that really impact us on a bigger basis on a larger scale. So that's the, that's the focus that we'll have for most of this conversation. Any questions, Max, anything you wanna add there? No, you've been killing it, Benita. I'm gonna let you keep going. Mm -mm, but please, next slide. So it is really deep. It might not say systemic, but if I was to put something between institution and structural, the, another word would be systemic. So what we're dealing with today is, and in our laws practice, or so when you look at the, the Senate and wonder, where am I in there? Where are their hoods? You know, that white supremacy culture and anti-Blackness permeates everything you do. You are, you are fed in, in the uterus white supremacy culture before you ever took your own breath. It's the matrix, y'all. It impacts voting rights. Why after 2020, because more Blacks came out to vote that we saw over 500 uh, uh, voter suppression laws introduced across the country. I, don't, I can't hardly think of a state that there wasn't something done. Uh, the criminal law, it is not an accident that you see more black and brown folks or other folks in the prison system. That's part of that institutional and structural or systemic racism. Poor people do more desperate things, right? It ain't because we just bad people, all right? Religion and colonialism, I think I've talked a little bit about how that works. All in the name of God, we've come and decided you're a savage and you need my religion. 
So we strip you of your beliefs because only one belief works. And that is that white light or those, those white supremacy kinds of culture systems. And all of this results in this dynamic of power and oppression of anyone who cannot attribute themselves or, or be relational to that white light or ambiguously related to the white light. So power and oppression, marginalization, all of that exists. And I don't care, even if you're sitting there thinking, I ain't oppressed because I got food and all this stuff, I guarantee you there's some level going on. But white supremacy culture, anti-Blackness, the historical context in which we show up, all people, Chinese people were put in camps, our Native American, our First Nation folks, you know, anyone who didn't could not get to the light whiteness has felt the power and oppression of racism. All right, next slide. So poll question for you all. And Amanda, did you want to chat or how are you going to do it? Just in the, oh, she just put it up. We have all the tools to end the HIV epidemic, true or false? You all have, yeah, I know this like, how did we get there, Vanita? You just went from here to here, but just trust us, it'll make sense. So we do, we have all the tools to end the epidemic. Okay, almost, so most folks said, 59% of y'all said yes, and 41% of y'all said no. Now for the for people who said we have all the tools, is anybody willing to come off mute? And you're gonna have to make it quick. If you, if you, if you start taking over 30 seconds, I'm gonna say, eh. So come off mute and, and um, tell us why you say we have all the tools. And I like one person who says that we don't. And I- Renee, uh, Renita, this is Oga. And the reason why I said yes, we do have all the tools. We just don't know how to do the right funding and the right places for it. Okay. And okay. we're missing the, the people that are most affected by HIV by putting them in research and, and doing some fundings around them. We're not giving that, that, you know. So you're saying we got all the tools. We're just not doing it right. Got you. Yeah. Okay, who said we don't have all the tools? If you, if, if somebody, I don't want to embarrass I said, anybody. I said we don't. Who's this? And, and what, this is Kaneen. Hey, Kaneen. And what we would need is a um, society that was not predicated on capitalism because we're more concerned about maintenance than cures. And so because the people who have the power are not going to um, change, how, change how capitalism works, that's not gonna happen. So, you know, it, I don't see it happening. So I, I just don't feel like we have all the tools because we don't have the kind of leadership that we need. I got you. Thank you. And and uh, yes, Crystal says she would have said yes too about five years ago. She's right. Go to the next slide. And I Hello? see what you're saying. Um, Terry. Yes, hi. Terry. What's up, Terry? Um, well, Wait, uh, Olga? Everything's fine. They can fill oh. for you. Was exactly you're going to call them? Can somebody or mute, Olga? Oh, thank you. I thought I saw a raised hand too. Did I? Okay, so second poll question. We can end the HIV epidemic if people would just be more responsible. So it's personal responsibility. Take, take charge of your health care. If people would just be more responsible, we could end the epidemic. So the first one said we had the tools and most of y'all said we do. And here, if we could end it, if everybody would just be more responsible. Okay, uh, quickly, if somebody wants to tell me why they said that's a true statement, because it looks like we didn't flip the script. Now we've got 60% saying that isn't a true statement and 39% that says it is, which really is a con conflicts with the last thing, but I understand why. Who wants to tell me why we do have, we could end it? Who said it's true? That's a true statement. 
quickly. Okay, who said that? Uh, oh. This is Marcia. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I feel that is if every, when you look at COVID, when more people took responsibility of their own health by wearing the mask and keeping a distance and sanitizing and so forth, we were able to drastically reduce the numbers of COVID. And I, yeah, I feel like if that was done, everyone were to do the same in HIV, we could do the same. Thank you, Marcia. Who who said that? That I totally get it. So who said that? Um, that's a false statement. Let me just say, I'm Jay. Oh, no. Go ahead, sweetie. Okay. The the reason I say no is because you can't you can't you you can't cure it if you have so many people living in rural areas that can't get to the doctor because it's so many miles away. And and things like that. Medication is so expensive and stigma. Wow. Stigma. Thank you so much. You all have highlighted what the, the real conflict here. Some of y'all believe, well, we got the tools, but then the same half believe people just need to be more responsible. And I hope y'all see how that, that's a conflict, right? <laughs> We got the tools, but but people need to be more responsible. Next slide. Thank you all for that. That was really good because so this last one check in for y'all. I so appreciate that. So now we've talked about we got the tools. People just need to be more responsible. So then why are black and brown people most impacted by HIV or black women? In the chat, I think that's in the chat. Is that right, um, Amanda? Yeah, yeah, in the chat or if you want to come off me. Oh, raise your hand. I yeah. see some. Because now we said we got the tools, but now we said we got to be more responsible. Now I'm asking you, but so if that's those both are true, why do, are Black people most impacted? Go ahead, Taylor. Hi, I apologize. I'm, I'm not on camera. Um, something that my agency recently explored was the deep contributions of systemic racism in healthcare in particular and how that causes disparities in viral suppression and um, specifically among black and African-American folks living with HIV versus white folks living with HIV. Um, and uh, sorry, totally just lost my train of thought. We may have the tools we need. We have antiretroviral therapy, we have prevention, we have all these different tools and messaging, but we are not using them in the right ways to um, get results to certain populations. Okay, thank you. Give me another person. I, Amanda, you can uh, you can call them because I can't see out who. Yeah, who. I see Tana's hand. Okay, Tana. I think uh, why are black women, black and brown folks, I, I would say the way the systems are built and the way the healthcare system is, you wanna take away black women and brown women's rights to reproductive justice, but also that stigma and that discrimination and not having the things that we need as black women, as brown folks, uh, because if the system was healthcare for all, we would have the tools that we need to be healthy, but we don't. Thank you, Tana. I'm that 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 was beautiful, and I'm seeing some comments in the chat. Uh, systemic racism, yes. Healthcare unequal access to healthcare, inequity in healthcare, systemic racism. Uh, all of those are good reasons, but I just need y'all to remember what you said on the first question, the second one, and now it sounds like there's just a little bit of a conflict. So we'll take. Yeah. This. I'm sorry. Oh, and we also like we also want a certain group of people to be beholden to the system, to be beholden to the government. We, we want a certain group of people to need that medication, to need those meds, to need that health care. We, we want a certain group of people to be beholden to that. And also on top of that, I want to add that um, there's always been this 
unspoken dynamic in some circles it is spoken that you know how the yellow pox got here and certain diseases was brought over here by the puritans and you know they always was like kind of like struggling with their immune systems and stuff and i think because we have not traditionally been known as a people who struggle with our immune system it's kind of is that creates that creates a different kind of stigma amongst us because when we sick it's horrible. We're not allowed to get sick. Like we just, <laughs> we shouldn't be sick. And so, and so that's our, like, if we don't weigh a certain thing, like we can't just be slim. We got to be sick. If you lose too much weight, something wrong with you. So, oh, you know, in our community, stigma hit, you know, 10 times harder. So, you know, we don't want to really go and get those services because we worried about that stigma. Okay. Thank you. Who, tell me that your name. Who was that? Kaneen. Kaneen. I should have known. Thank you, Kaneen. So mm -hmm. I want y'all to, you all are on the right track to processing and then developing your own analysis on here. We're going to give you a little bit of new information. But next slide. I think you, I love you. Thank y'all for uh, talking about this. Uh, or responding to our questions because I'm seeing some great stuff even in the chat about policing black and brown or women's bodies and and systemic. I love this, but I want to. We're going to move on to talk a little bit about and more money and treatment than in, in prevention. Girls, please. But we're going to talk a little bit about HIV is a racial justice issue. And how many of y'all know that? And I want you to put a yes in the chat if you believe it or if you know it. HIV is a racial justice issue, period. Black and brown behavior is no different than any other behavior, but we are still the most impacted. So I want to talk about why people know that. Next slide. So we're going to dig, dig a little bit. I want to get to um, Max for y'all. So I, I talked to y'all about racism being prejudice plus power with the big P, right? Well, let's be clear, most of white supremacy culture and the social construct of race was all about power. Let's not forget that, that it is all about power. And if you, you know this Frederick Douglass um, quote, you know it's much longer. And so we shortened it, and you know, that uh, power concedes nothing without a demand. We're seeing that the desperate attempt of our, or, our of white folks today to claim power will even tell you that the sky is green, even though we all see that it's not. So power will work hard to maintain itself. And I, I'm not going to read Huey Newton's um, quote, but I want you all to remember it because I know I'm running out of time and I'm taking too much time, but it's about power, y'all. And you all are here or in the fellowship or HMP to build power in communities because power is where it's at. Where we lack money, we can make up in, in um, numbers or will. And I don't even believe we always lack money. That's what folks want us to believe. Next slide. So why people always ask, okay, Vanita, y'all said HIV, you know that it's a racial justice issue. But until we start talking about it, I didn't hear no one saying this. And I know they were, but in case you want to know why it is a, a racial justice issue, because in my opinion, racial injustice is a key driver of the epidemic. It, so those things that, that are, are, are present in injustices are what drive the epidemic. HIV is a racial justice issue for me because I don't know how we sit there and watch a phenomena or a, a medical condition that mainly impacts black and brown folks. We saw it with COVID and you just had to breathe it. We know HIV is harder to get. So it's just not a coincidence that black and brown people are the most impacted. We don't have more sex. We don't have, we're, we don't, it's not that. The data doesn't support that. It's what the traditional HIV view, we just, we want to use race in data. Y'all know I was in Ryan White and then we saw the data and then everything else tries to go talk without talking about the why. They have the data, but there's never context. There's never the story of the why. And to me, racial injustice is a key driver. Those social and structural drivers that I told you all, that, that fourth, those third and fourth levels of racism, um, institutional and structural, those are the key drivers of the epidemic. Classism, they, they're inbred in classism and discrimination. Poverty, who are the people most poor? 
And even if whites are the, we have more white folks in poverty, their experience is still different than black folks in poverty. All roads lead back to race or racism. You cannot look at this epidemic and never only use race for the data. You've got to begin to understand the why or ask the questions why. All policy, service, and funding decisions have an impact on all people. So everything they're telling you about the funding, you know, the policy, the services are supposed to impact people the same. But they do not. There is no such thing as a race neutral policy funding decision or law. It just isn't. I don't care if there's no race mentioned in it, but if the impact is greater on one group of people, you must look at the impact. Everything has a racial social justice impact. A speeding law if we get stopped more, we might have less income, so we will be the ones that may not show up because of our job or can pay more because of our lower income, and therefore we're impacted differently. In D.C., I live there, more, more, so many of us are getting our car towed with all these tickets that you couldn't pay, and by the time you went to pay them, then they didn't double, so people are not getting their cars. No law or policy is race neutral. So when if you say, oh, we're going to call all the people who are supposed to be on Ryan White getting HIV med, and that looks race neutral. But if 70% of those people are black, that ain't race neutral that you're going to call. And you need to look at what does that look like calling 70% people being the peace police, police on just black folks. So there's no such thing. Next slide. And so it impacts us every day. And one little thing I want you all to think about is when you're really thinking about what, why are Black folks most impacted? I just told you racial injustice is one of the reasons. It ain't because we want HIV. We know we got higher viral loads in our communities because of these root causes of the epidemic. HIV is the external light, external symptom, the leaf on the tree of that is a symptom of all of those structural and institutional problems. You need to get to the root of those problems. The visible symptom is that leaf, HIV, but what is under that leaf? It ain't sex. I know we think it's sex, but it isn't because you could be married, you could be whatever. There's no prevention you can do for HIV other than abstinence. Testing is not a prevention. Treatment maybe prevention, education is not 100%. You must look at the root causes. And if you've got a policy that's treating the symptom, that's great. But recognize you're treating the symptom, not the root cause. If you're not getting that unemployment, mass incarceration, the issues that make us vulnerable to HIV and all the things on this side, language, culture, country of origin, we're all other in some ways that create that vulnerability that puts us at risk, that makes us vulnerable, excuse me. I don't use words like risk. I believe we're vulnerable. And those are some of the reasons in equities. Next slide. But root cause analysis. Well, I used to say, oh, HIV is 100% preventable until Wahida hit me up. I can do everything right married or not, and still might end up with HIV. And it shows up in the work. I don't care what work you do in HIV. It shows up in the prevalence that we keep ignoring. We'll say the data and then don't talk about the why, the context, the story. We'll do behavior shaming. It's got to be those Black gay men. The CDC said, oh, one, one out of two of y'all will end up with HIV. And they didn't know that was violence because they showed data without the story. So it just looked like there was something about our Black gay men versus the, the context, the story, the root cause of why one out of two of them may be. So there's a lot of shaming by behavior. And I want y'all to start questioning that. And if you are doing it like I used to, stop yourself. Microaggressions we talked about, disparities. Remember all of those health conditions, COVID is in the air and we still got it more. You know why? Because we're essential workers. We might live in homes that we can't space. We might be in the church because we have to be. All kinds of reasons. When people talk about they don't see color, that is not a good thing, y'all. Because if you see me without my context and my story, you ain't treating me right. Those policies and procedures that are out there, voter suppression, all of that is how it shows up. 
Okay, the leadership, who are the decision makers? If, if most of us are black women, but all the decision makers are white, cis, gay men or someone else, they can't make decisions for my benefit. Okay, so if we're not in the leadership, the decision making, we should be asking, why aren't we being hired? Stop sharing your story and emotional labor for free when everybody else in the room getting paid. The service is not being designed by us. Those are the ways it shows up. Somebody else comes up with an intervention and decides that it'll work for me or in the funding and, and, and the research, you all, the lack of us in research. Next slide, you all mentioned that earlier. So I, I wanna honor that. So after hearing that, it shows up in the hiring. Do most of the people you know that are black, they're in prevention, right? They're testers. Are they in the decision-making roles? Are they the ones deciding? Are the peer navigators? who are people with lived experience making the decisions. So I want y'all to say now, here's a check-in before I turn this over to Max. Have, have you seen anti-Blackness or racism show up in HIV spaces or in HIV advocacy? And if so, how? And you could put in the chat or shouldn't I be nearing my end, Amanda? Um, so, yeah, yeah, you have a few minutes, Vinita. Okay. But how have you seen it? I want to hear. I don't want, I don't, we don't need a soapbox. I'm the only one to get to be on one today and Max, but I want you to tell me. And if you haven't, please don't feel no shame because sometimes we don't know until we know, like the things we just assume because we've been hearing it and seeing it for so long, we don't know that it's wrong, right? Um, Terry, go ahead. The way that I see anti-Blackness show up in HIV spaces is that throughout the decades, they would be like, uh, maybe 2010, they would be like, okay, we're only going to do uh, gay Black men, or we're going to do 2015 Latin X, and they kept, or that's, they were following the money, or, right. or now it's trans, right? So now uh, the black women got to uh, pull a seat up to the table. Oh, you told me don't get on the soapbox, but that's what I, that's my <laughs> observation. Thank you. And so what, what Terry is saying, funding decisions, that's where they see it. They, you know, we become targets instead of people. We're going to target black gay men. Tell people to stop targeting us. Okay. Who else wants to talk about? How, have you seen it? And then how? Seen it in research. Hey, this is Elder Antonieta. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, how are you, Benita? Blessings. Um, I've seen it daily for the over the years, working not only for Iris House, but other agencies, especially when they're doing outreach. The peer educators are out there giving away their stories, the information, the powers to be or not. And when it comes around time for a raise, they get a three or four or 5%. And my poor peer educators are lucky if they get a $25 addition on their stipend yeah. and not even get it in cash, but maybe get it in on a card. And that, that comes from a lot of agencies within New York City. You are so right, Elder, because we are minimized. And, and someone wrote me something in the chat. I want to, you can, let's, let's expand this discussion because I told you some of those root causes could be gender-based violence, transphobia, homophobia. So remember, if, even though it says anti-Blackness, you know, that's, that applies to our trans folks, right? Our gender non-conforming, our non-binary folks. How have you seen anti-Blackness show up for all of our community or for our black trans folks are non-binary. So don't just think it's a, a race thing. All of these issues, race and social, the racial and social justice uh, perspective impacts communities of color. It impacts all marginalized folks. So someone else, I'm Olga, I see you, but I wanna see if someone else wants to come out. Oh. And so when and, and I need people to understand that when we're funding black communities, we're funding our trans folks, we're funding our non-binary, that we're not separate. We all live in a big house in our community and we got rooms, but we all share a dining room table. So I need y'all to know that you cannot separate trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming, our gay and lesbian community from black folks. So when you're thinking of this issue, 
or anti-blackness, we're also going across gender equities and everything. So please, I'll give one more person who wants to talk maybe about how anti-blackness shows up for trans, gender non-conforming or non-binary folks. And if we, and then we'll move on. If anybody wants to come off. Yeah, um, like for how that shows up for me is, and and unfortunately, this is a, this is, the 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 plantation runs so it's so it's so fierce that you you'll be pitted against your own people in the work, and you know, as someone who worked for the state at one time. I have realized, and I've in in October I'll be have living with HIV for twenty years, and I needed to have a voice because there's so few in our community that are in a position to be a voice, and so sometimes the the it can look like giving the most vocal person a job so you can tokenize them and make them shut up. Oh, come on with it. I'm going to go to the next slide. You need to don't go nowhere yourself. OK, but I want y'all to just like when we saw the uprisings, black trans women were being killed, but nobody was marching. And I'm telling y'all, trans justice is gender justice. If all black folks don't rise, none of us rise. And I want to address something really quickly here that especially for black women who we represent such a big proportion of this epidemic and I'm talking cis and trans and you all think it's cause you just had sex with the wrong person or that it was your fault, the down low brother. And I'm telling you that that institutional and those structural barriers and those things that caused the, the viral load to be higher in your community had nothing to do with your behavior. I don't care what you did. You had sex with one person at a time or you might've had multiple that night. I'm gonna tell you, sex workers were, were cheating condoms in the early 90s because I was out there on the street with them. I want y'all to understand the historical and social context that we still show up with. And those things on the slide deck, those, uh, those four stereotypes that have been historical still permeate for black women. We're still not seen as, you know, this, given the level of a pedestal of womanhood like white women are. So when we want to, welfare was created for white women, it was fine, white widows until black women got on it. Then it became a problem. We got the lazy welfare queen, the matriarch, the mammy, you know, and I'm telling in the Jezebel, either you're over-sexualized, or one of these four stereotypes, I'm sorry to say, still permeate. And I and these four pictures on the side with Andre Lord and Sandra Bland and 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 Sojourner Truth uh, is. I just want y'all to know we've come a long way, but have we arrived yet? When's the last time you heard Sandra Bland's name? Okay. So I'm just telling you that historically, no one has protected the black woman. Next slide. We live. And along with, and I say black, I'm not talking African-American because black encompasses every color under the rainbow for me, but we live at intersections that no other group lives at. Speaking a different language, having a different culture, uh, employment, racism, patriarchy, you know, misogyny. We experience things at this intersection and and if we went through the tr our trans sisters, we would see this list grow even longer. But the gender inequities in economic justice, the gender inequities in patriarchy, paternalism, racism, we live. And so it is not who you had sex with. That person who you had sex with is experiencing these two. You just, as a woman, experience the you have a unique experience with all of this. So it is not something you did. It is a system you were born into that has created higher viral loads in your community that gave you less opportunities to move in a different place. That gave you less opportunities to have access healthcare or going to healthcare that was affirming that you didn't go in there and feel like you know you you couldn't say nothing or had healthcare in a language that made it accessible to you. So there is way more at stake. And I know I have ran over and I got to turn this over to Max. So is that my last slide? And I see some hands. And, and so I'm going to end and Max, I'll let you take it here, Max, so I can stop because I'll keep going. Uh, Max is going to start off with talking about the definition, which we didn't talk about before, of racial justice. And it's just one. There's so many. Max, you want to take this? 
Yes, thank you so very much, Benita, uh, for all your wisdom and, and the spaces that you brought in here. Um, by our definition of racial justice, uh, it was a collective practice of people of color and allies to identify, dismantle, and heal from the many external and internal harms of structural and institutional racism. We say all that to like racial justice has to be a collaborative action. It is not something that can be individually done. It cannot be something that is uh, done by, by, by just one person or a few people within the community. It has to be uh, done collectively and particularly in, in something that we use within understanding racial justice in a piece that I was intersectional solidarity uh, and understanding within this, like the, the definition of intersectionality that comes from Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw um, speaks to a level like when we talk about intersectionality, how, how we're going to do this um, is the interconnected natures of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender, as Benita had talked about, as they play as they apply to given individuals and groups regarded to their creating overlaps. So we all, you know, I have uh, identities as a black cisgender queer man, right? So all those are, are identities that I, that I take in, and some come with privilege, some also come. Uh, uh, Someone come with privilege. Uh, some come with levels of prejudice that I deal with uh, every day. And there's different layers, how in which those layers interact with each other. And we also understand how in which specifically Black women, and then also to a greater level, uh, Black trans women are, are, are dealt with in an even deeper deficit within this, within this uh, system. Taking within that, that we also um, using things that we learned from MEPA, from other parts of, that we've done in this work, that we we go now, we take it now into go, going into the what's the next piece? What how do we build together? It's building up from the from the from from the people that are most impacted, um, and being able to build power across these communities. And when I think about intersectionality, the next layer to that is also solidarity. And that's solidarity within communities showing up for one another. That next level to what Vanita was talking about is showing up for those communities that may not look like yours, but are also impacted by this, um, by structural racism. And that is when we talk about um, being able to use these tools, that is the next space. Next slide, please. Um, and as we're applying a racial justice framework to advocacy, it's important to always remember those that are most impacted by it. Uh, when we think about meaningful involvement of people living with HIV, make sure that we are living, listening to people with living with HIV, the communities that are most impacted by it, which includes Black men, uh, Black women, Black transgender people, uh, and also within that understanding other communities that are, are disproportionately impacted and how in which that goes into a coalition of the work that we want to do. Um, for many of us, when I think about this and applying this work um, on state work, national work, um, and even very local work is a lot of times uh, in some of these places, first in local areas, we may have a plenary of, of, of people in order to, to make a decision. Um, but in many times there are different stigmas that people have and other understandings, but also just general racism that, that folks deal with um, that we do not get to always uh, make decisions that are best for our communities and engage. Next slide, please. Uh, 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 we have to think about how in which um, HIV is a sign of inequality in this country. And we all we have to do is look at uh, how in which COVID uh, impacted our country during that time period and continues to impact us this day. I've had many friends that have gone down with COVID um, in the last couple of weeks is <clears throat> understanding how in which um, who is desirable, how in which we talk around heteronormativity, how in which we talk about how in which we talk about um, communities, uh, sex workers, um, people and within, you know, what cultures are considered deemed uh, loved and care about and worthy to get care for. Those are all the things that we see within this. And when we look at the HIV uh, within this country and even in, in the international context, it is a sign of inequities that we see. And our ability to push back against that, especially in these politically charged times. When I said this, uh, I was this was like three jobs ago, and uh, uh, a couple presidents, and <laughs> um, and a bunch of different uh, governors before, right? And it is still a very politically charged time. It is still very important for us to create, and even more so to create the space that we need to do this. And, and showing up for one another and creating that solidarity is one of the biggest things that we can do in showing up for one another, but also pushing back against uh, the powers that be. Next slide, please. Um, 
when we think about like operizing racial justice and what it means to reimagine, re recreate, um, and co-create um, a, a liberated world with liberated spaces, is we have to first understand the history and where we came from. Can't do this um, without understanding how we got here, uh, how how in which these spaces were created, uh, white supremacy culture, how in which the history of like white people in this country, how people became white, um, how in which we uh, uh, separated different races, not just in this country but also other places, um, and, and the history of how in which the Transatlantic slave trade impacts us in this country and across the world, and how in which we deal with one another, and how in which laws have been done to, to make sure that there is um, particularly racial capitalistic laws that do not allow for people to grow wealth, uh, especially people of darker skin tones, being able to, to grow wealth in our country. That's an important piece. Um, working in right relation, accountability, and ecosystem uh, issue sector. Uh, community ecosystem for collective change. This is important. Um, we got to start bringing folks together, right? Um, and I am not doing well of keeping up with the chat while I'm presenting. So um, if there's something that folks need me to look into, just-, just I got you. Me. I got you. <laughs> Thank you, Benita. Uh, implementing uh, interventions that use an intersectional analysis. And as we talk about this intersectionality, it's important to understand it impact multiple systems, right? We can't have something that just um, is one of the- uh, uh, one of the folks that is on here, I talked about there's different times where they put one community and we're like, oh, we're going to put a bunch of resources here. and We're just going to focus on that community. That is a fundamental failed, uh, failed way to do it, right? We have to think about how it is collectively engaged, making sure that different communities are given the resources that they need to support it, but also thinking about how in which those relationships of some of those communities are with one another or which one another within uh, the clinical background of going into a clinic, but also the other pieces. So, um, within this, uh, and thinking about what what our relationship to was um, years ago, and thinking about this, was we needed to hear from our communities. We know that our communities were hurting in a time that um, uh, the guy that's currently under like ninety three uh, indictments right now is uh, was president of the United States and uh, <clears throat> was was pushing into a system that, that was seeing more people going to solidarity, but we we're also losing that, that focus within the HIV movement. And, um, you know, stop me if you've heard this before, because it sounds like, you know, things may be repeating itself, but understanding that, that, that we have to take racial justice, be it fundamentally and within our strategic domestic HIV movement. And we also saw in many cases during that uh, uh, last administration that the, the racial justice part was taken completely out of it and they tried to do things with the bio biomedical expertise and we have seen how much that had failed in so many different way ways and many different diseases, but particularly in this one. Um, <clears throat> we maintain at the core of true love is accountability to one another, to the beloved community. And accountability is important if we're talking about the ending of HIV epidemic, when multiple presidents have talked about ending the HIV epidemic, multiple cities have said they will end this epidemic, and they are no uh, nowhere closer to that than the, they were before, then we actually need to start thinking about what systems need to be uprooted and what things need to change. Um, we highlighted things such as the Black Lives Matter, that no human being is illegal, uh, and, and that, that everyone deserves the actual access to health care, comprehensive sexual and reproductive care. And these are things that we have seen constantly attacked since that time. And we understand that it is important for us that work within the HIV movement, that are a part of the HIV movement and a part of the, the greater movement for Black lives, for people's liberation, um, is to make sure that our people have access to reproductive rights, and regardless of court, uh, country of origin, and it was important for us understanding within the Declaration of Liberation was that we are in solidarity with each other's communities, and there's no community that we are leaving out within this, right? Uh, and then the work of the Rights to Justice Age is, is not new. This is something that has been historic. Um, uh, 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 man, uh, Boundaries of Blackness uh, by Dr. Kathy Cohen uh, out of Chicago is an important book uh, written in the 90s, speaks to some of this history of, of us working within this movement. And then uh, we commit to develop and, and nurturing a leadership body. It's important to have and nurture new leaders as we are continuing to do. That's something that um, while we're talking to all of you on this wonderful call, while we'll continue to present on this and why Vanita has been doing the wonderful work that she will always be doing, is, is, is cultivating these new leaders and these next steps for folks to, to, to think about how we're doing this next level. Um, and then this, this other thing is, you know, sometimes we're like, uh, you know, people are thinking, you know, uh, 
folks are, are fragile around some of this stuff. It's like now when we work together, we're some of the most powerful people that we can ever be. Um, and that's something that I, I, I fundamentally believe in solidarity of and something that we have to continue to move on. Um, so that's one big major thing. <clears throat> um, next slide. So the real question is like, I, I talked about a, a lot of, use a lot of big words, a lot of big things, uh, concepts and pieces. How do we do it? Uh, how, do, how do we start to implement it? So I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, but um, one is implementing racial justice into our organizations and political strategies. I'm gonna talk specifically about the racial justice index later. Um, but, um, and if your organization that you may work for or connected to getting services does not, is not going through a racial justice index, you should ask them about that and they, they can contact, I believe it's AIDS United, but also uh, also good uh, context of others around, like what does it mean to actually um, start to move into a racial justice view uh, that also in, in uplifts those communities that are most impacted. Uh, and when we're talking about saying the communities that are most impacted, that we're talking about the communities that are most impacted by HIV within that space, which typically are also some of the communities that are most in, impacted by housing and security that are implemented um, <clears throat> by not having access to healthcare. And you can see these multi-layered, pieces of intersectional issues that are impacting those folks. And for us to think about how in which we're uh, ending the HIV epidemic, we have to deal with the root causes of issues that are that people are going through. And with that, um, that means dealing with the housing issue. Uh, I know like recently in, in New York, uh, you know, with housing works and some of the things that they've said in the last couple of years is like, you can't talk about ending HIV without also ending homelessness. So they have to do both, right? Um, we have to think about how in which we're engaging most of these these tables, right? Um, and I, I I feel you on getting rid of some of these tables, right? Uh, and, and and really shaking them up and getting more of our folks, one, getting our folks in there, but also creating new tables that are making decisions from the people that are most impacted. Um, and ensure equity around uh, allocation of resources, and this means when when these uh these these tables that are created that that many times we're not allowing us to be in um, is once we are in those rooms to make sure that those folks are actually listening to, and making sure those resources are given to the people that are most important within our communities. Um, and also using that empirical evidence, you know, as, as someone said, you know, the research. Getting better research is an important part of racial justice. Also, understanding that there is a limit to research because it is historically done in a racist way is also two parts that we have to understand within that. Um, working to transform it and when necessary, dismantle institutions. Uh, this means dismantling tables that ain't working for us. This means getting rid of uh, uh, organizations, calling them out, protesting, um, uh, boycotting, whatever that means in different ways to make sure that those organizations are are changed. And it also means sometimes transforming some of them from within um, to do so, right? Uh, I have seen uh, this, this, th these problems happen in some of the largest uh, white led AIDS service organizations. And I've also seen this done within black organizations um, that are within the HIV um, and also led by uh, communities of color in between. It, it is something uh, that that all organizations have to take 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 heed of and understanding, um, but particularly in thinking about the communities that you are a part of, and the communities that have power within your spaces to think about how in which they are actually making sure that these parts are done. Now I'm gonna go a little bit in how we do a little bit. Of that. I'm gonna go next slide. Um, uh, well before that actually, uh, I've I've said this like. A bunch of times, I know Benita truly believes in it. MEPA, meaningful involvement of people living with HIV, is, is a fundamental thing. Um, this also means, particularly like communities of color that are most impacted by it, and how that also shows up in making sure those people are part of it. Um, I've been part of, you know, uh, Ryan White planning councils that did not look like the community that were most impacted, right? Um, didn't look very much like it at all. Uh, and that is also one of those first things of looking like some of the problem, like some of those folks have been on it for a long time, while the epidemic has changed, we can also grow those tables to also look like more like the community that is most impacted and that's something also important to think about next slide. So, ooh, this is a good one. This is a good one. Um, check in question. Uh, mm, what could radical leadership Hearing those pieces that I just had talked about, like what type of changes we need around racial justice work, what could radical leadership look like from an aligned collaborative group of people of color in HIV community and movement work? And much like Benita said, um, and, and much love to all y'all, but I do want answers, but 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 keep them short. Anyone want to tackle this one? I know this one might be hard to put in the chat, but you're also welcome to put it in the chat. But if anyone would like to tackle this one, Terry? 
Okay. Um, black, old, young, disabled, gay, straight, handicapped. That's that's educated, uneducated. <laughs> and oh, the faith leaders, yeah. And the churches, teaching the churches, yeah, getting the preachers on, on board. That's all I got. No, thank you for that. I, I do think it does look like having those uh, those different communities at the table. I think there's even more to add to that as, as we continue to think about it. I see a, a wonderful hand up that I want to hear. Uh, Deidre, you want to you take this? Um, hey, I, I, uh, hey, y'all. Hey, um, oh, thank y'all. One and first and foremost, Vanita, Max, um, for if y'all have not ever heard these two, surprise and welcome. Um, but I, I think that also looks like uh, similar to Terry, I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, also looks like that. I think it looks like those folks that um, are, are marginalized, stigmatized, um, I'm not going to call out any of those names that what we may say in community, um, that have some historical background. There's going to be some underground folks that um, we have cast to the side that also need, at, need to be at the table. And then I also think that there also needs to be some folks that are new, that are looking at this, that haven't looked at this, also from, from some fresh eyes and um, some historical factors and, and folks as well. Um, but just all of us at this table, those that are interested, not interested in everything else in between. Um, but that's just my two cents and thank y'all. Thank you for that so very much, Deja, uh, and bringing up those important pieces of it. And also as folks are thinking about how in which we would bring this, shout out to y'all bringing returning citizens. Another big one I I'll be wrong as a, as a person that truly believes in harm reduction here is drug users and drug uh, sellers to also be within that space. And, and as we are thinking about ending that HIV epidemic and how in which that comes together, right? Um, and of course, uh, sex workers. And uh, I, I do truly believe that uh, radical leadership is courageous. Um, as as Crystal, shout out to Crystal, I ain't seen you in a while, uh, courageous and, and, and being able to tell the truth of what communities are being able to do. And I think it would, if you do have those communities that are most impacted actually in the room talking through it, we actually are able to get to the in, closer to ending HIV epidemic because you have the communities that are most impacted telling you what they actually need. Um, and that's one of the big importance of, of the MEPA piece and getting those parts through. Next slide. So I'm going to bring up a couple of different examples. I'm going to let Benita or, you know, some of y'all actually on this call uh, are just as uh, connected to this. One of the big things that we started uh, was the Declaration of Liberation, uh, which is uh, which uh, Benita, myself, uh, and about 15, I can't, I think it was like 20 others of us uh, helped yeah. create this, uh, the coalition uh, of bringing this and being able to put up a, 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 a if you haven't had a chance to look at the Declaration of Liberation, it's a wonderful document of understanding what we said we needed to end the actual HIV epidemic um, from a racially just uh, and bringing it into our domestic HIV movement and connecting it to larger movements uh, that are around, uh, again, as we said, um, having no one part, no, nobody being illegal. Um, and that Black Lives Matter uh, and, and understanding those frameworks and bringing that into also our racially just movement and bringing in different communities of color uh, in order to work and learn from one another, because that is a big important piece of that. Uh, within also that time space, there was other entities that came out of that time that were also connected to what was created originally from racial justice action now coming together. Uh, one of those uh, that I, I got to give highlight, another highlight to Vanita is Black South Rising, and specifically as us talking about, we were not hearing enough while being, I was a person who was not living uh, in the South this whole time. I had recently moved back. Uh, I'm from Georgia, I live in Atlanta. And uh, I, was, I was seeing a lot of people that didn't look like me talk for the people that that, that were living down there. And I ain't like that. Um, and Benita, uh, who's uh, a, another wonderful person living in the South in Texas, had, had, had brought a group of us in the South to talk about like, now we're rising, we're bringing this together. And along, I got to, you know, uh, shout out both Charles Stevens uh, in the, for the Declaration of Liberation and the Black South Rising, who is the executive director of the Counter Narrative Project. 
It was important and for the Nana same. Tana here. Yep. Nana yeah. here. I saw Nana in the, in the comments. Shout out to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, also, a declaration in the piece for us creating HIV racial justice now of these two different coalitions that were speaking to racial justice and HIV movement and hearing from the communities that are most impacted and being able to put out clear statements that they needed, um, including within declarations of liberation uh, and Black South Rising, a relook at the Minority AIDS Initiative um, and, and making sure that it actually goes to communities that needed the most in the, in the parts of the country that are, are needed the most, along with um, making sure that that folks that work in the workforce are being accountable to the people that that are within it and how in which we're also when we're advocating for laws that we're not just advocating for money for big organizations, but we're advocating for the for the end of the HIV epidemic, as many of them have said um, within that it also helped. Uh, in the creation of the We the People plan, which is a black strategy in HIV, which was a, a response to the Trump's uh, very biomedical plan that came under the, that administration's and creating a plan that actually took the social determinants of health, understood coalition, understood power and, and building with, with one another and also going up against other power contexts and what we needed to change. Um, and the last two I really wanna say are like, taking the some of those tables that we have been talking about because the first three were creating new tables, tables for us, um, by us, to be accountable to us and thinking about what our communities truly need. The next two examples are, uh, these are taking current tables, which is one, um, uh, HIV philanthropy guiding principles is, is really important. And shout out to Benita again. I'm, I pretty much got it. She's a part of all five of these. Uh, <laughs> just through what it says, like nothing on here, Benita was not a part of. Uh, but uh, within the HIV, like changing how we thought about uh, funding HIV. And that's been one of the things that had to change was how in which we're funding HIV. Who, what communities are we actually funding? How are we thinking about uh, community-led organizations? Who are, who are those organizations now? What do they look like? How has that shifted over the last 20 years given to that we've fundamentally divested from community-based organizations? What do, what do we need to change to, to change that space up? This was led through many conversations that I know Benito was a very big important part of, of changing um, how in which we thought about funding within HIV and making more guided principles around that. And then lastly, um, within the public policy council that I, um, was introduced uh, many years ago while I was a part of the ACE Foundation of Chicago. Um, <laughs> oh, man, that was a great one. Um, you know, I'm always... <laughs> you should, you Folding chairs. Bring your own, you know, I'm big about bringing my own chairs to this table. You know, I got a couple folding ones, you know, right over here on the side, just in case, because you never know when people don't know how to act. My family's from Montgomery, just by the way. And... Um, to understand within this is within the the Asian United Public Policy Council was there was a, there was at a time and space where I remember being one of the few uh, black faces. I was definitely one of the few faces at that time under I, under thirty that was at the table. Um, yeah. <laughs> so understanding those those contexts of like there was a lot of people that were missing uh, that that don't have always a voice at some of these large tables that were very important for us ability to end policy. We had to. Um, think about how in which we're doing a racial justice index. I also want to um, shout out my old boss, Rania Copeland, uh, who is also important for, for putting in that racial justice index within the, the Public Policy Council um, to make sure that organizations that are part of this policy council that leads around HIV policy is are actually racially just themselves. Um, and if they are not, there will be an, a, a series of, of different bases that they actually invest in becoming more racially just organizations, that which leads to also better policies on our end being advocated for because these organizations have boards that are more reflective of their community, have um, executive leadership that is more reflective of the HIV epidemic. Um, have um, community in, input sessions constantly to also think about how in which they're doing that. That was a part of the, us being able to put in an index, push for an index for these organizations to do this. And again, like Bedina just put in the chat, start asking your organizations to, you know, uh, if they ain't done it yet, 
and you don't know the the results of the racial justice index, they should also brought up those. And I think one of the big things thinking about how in which we are able to have more racial just spaces, what it means to take to do this is one, it, it does mean changing some of these these corrupt tables or tables that are not always heard and, and, and been there for communities that are most impacted. But also it means starting some of your own tables and, and own networks to say like, hey, this is what this is. This is how this kind of change, you know, so uh, and, and pushing then on some of those other tables and having relationships with some of those power brokers uh, and pushing them on the, and also then bringing together. Uh, one of the things is um, there was, you know, I said Benita was a part of all of these um, and there was other folks that were also pushing on different, uh, Nana's one of them. We brought up Charles, we brought up Ronnie, we brought up different um, executive leadership, but also uh, folks that were working in middle groups of organizations who always don't always get the the, the shout outs, right? Um, that are literally moving and moving some of these organizations. And as a person who's, you know, infiltrated a couple organizations and tried to make them better while being there. Um, I know that that is hard work is not always the, the most luxurious work that for y'all that are working in health departments for y'all that are um, working at, uh, at your local ASO or just you know trying to keep the kids off the block you know all of this is important to that to, to, to this like greater work that we're do all of your stories are important um for how in which we think about ending the HIV epidemic so all of those are important pieces that we're thinking about ending the HIV epidemic and one of the biggest spaces to understand this is is one, start to organize your own communities, um, but then also organize those communities to talk to other communities and think about how they can build together. That is one of the most important things that I think of that, that we can do when we talk about racially just. Um, and that means it could be other black communities. It could be um, other people of color communities. It could be um, different gender communities that, that, that you may not always engage with uh, all the time, but thinking about how in which you're engaged in that and includes, you know, for me uh, as a person who doesn't actively go to church, but you know, right now, yeah. I'll be up. <laughs> um, so like engaging with faith community, engaging with um, <clears throat> engaging with faiths that don't always look like ours. I want to make sure that those spaces are brought in. Um, next slide. I don't even know. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> I want to open it up for uh, yeah, yeah. questions, thoughts folks have off of those many things that we just presented there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Max. That was amazing um, and covered so much in such a short amount of time. Um, I just want to also quickly uplift before we go into kind of questions and closing um, that since, you know, I am like we are holding a PW in face here, I want to just make sure that we're uplifting our commitment to trans liberation. I know there is some a comment really um, kind of uh, around funding and targeted funding. And I just want to be clear that, you know, when we're talking about, well, First, that language matters, right? And that when we're saying, when we're talking about our trans community, we don't use the words like the trans, right? We wanna refer to folks um, in a people first language, with people first language as um, like trans community or folks of trans experience. Um, and also to acknowledge that trans and gender expansive folks are part of our community and they deserve resources and focus programs as Nana had mentioned in the comments, right? It's important that HI, as she said, it's important that HIV resources are moving towards Black cis and trans communities where uh, the need is, and PWN will continue to fight for Black liberation, including Black trans liberation, right? Um, this presentations around racial justice. Um, so, you know, oppressors win when we're fighting among ourselves for crumbs instead of looking at how power is structured to uplift white supremacy. Um, and so when Black cis and trans women are free, we will all be free. And this is exactly the words of Nana um, and um, and Vanita, you had also made this comment as yeah. well, so thank you. I, I just really wanna say too that, you know, I hope people will take a moment to think about that because when we go into a room and we say, well, you gave it to the black gay men there, we are causing our own division in our community. The, the issue isn't that they gave it there. The issue is we need it here too. So, because the, that, that dynamics and making those statements said, no, not black gay men, me. And it, it gives into a scarcity mindset. I want black gay men. I want black trans women. I want black cis women. We all deserve it. So I'm just saying so that we don't inadvertently or cause us, us to be fighting within our own community by going in meetings and arguing against my brother or my sister over here. We wanna argue and advocate for all. 
And so I don't go into a space saying, don't give it to them, give it to me. I'm saying they need it and so do we. And so I just wanted to offer that. Go ahead. So we don't like, oh, you got the blands, black, the trans women now. No, they have women now and we, and we want them to have this group as well. I'm not arguing against any other community that we all need. And when we let them off the hook by buying into that scarcity model, we have just given in to that white supremacy culture that's taking place right there. So I'm sorry, Amanda, go ahead. No, that was great. Thank you, Benita. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll pass it back to you both to, to close this out or talk about, um, I know you dropped some really amazing questions in there, um, Benita about kind of what does racial justice, racial equity, black liberation mean to folks? Um, I think that's a really great question, but I also wanna open it up to you um, both to, to um, kind of talk with one another or with you know, folks on the call about next steps and, and any, other, any other things that you have in your mind. Well, Max, anything for you? I think I've said most everything. You know, I, I'm very interested also in like how folks feel about like being able to build these uh, local coalitions on the ground. Uh, I think one of the, the important things is uh, build local where you are um, and then also work with the uh, with different entities, the national uh, and state entities to be able to build statewide coalitions and how that connects to national work. I think the building and relationship with one another is one of the important, more important peoples to racial justice. I also want to say this, and this is uh, to all my white folks on, on, on the line here. Um, it is just as important that you organize your community uh, and organize uh you know, just as important for me to, you know, call out my father when he's being homophobic. Uh, it is just as important for, for you to be not just calling out your family, but like bringing in a community. Uh, um, one thing that I always like to say, we don't we don't fight. Uh, and this is a a quote from uh, uh, Fred Hampton, who's a freedom fighter out, out of Chicago. Um, you know, we don't fight fire, best with fire. Um, we, we, we say you got to put fire out, best with water. So we don't fight racism with racism. We fight racism with solidarity, uh, and that that's a, a big important piece. Is like showing up for one another is how we fight racism. Um, building with one another and putting out clear policies, things that you know that are coming from the people, and using that that, that as an apparatus to do that is an important piece. Um, and would love to hear if there's any like examples, things you're working with, struggling with, thinking about around um, how you're building those things and how you want to think about building out that more, if it's in your local community or, um, how in which to think about building it larger, uh, wherever you are. I want to first say, I think that, um, I've been really, um, blessed and just affirmed by the, um, language that I've heard, like the presenters use and just Amanda coming back to echo things that, or inclusive of the trans community. I feel like it's important to um, have grace for each other because as, as many beautiful things as the internet has done for us, it has also created a new um, challenge to us building collectively, which is like this divisive propaganda that is often used to divide us, which is often like, and it spills over into um, 3D spaces where we're physically in connection with each other. And the reason why I can speak about that so with such conviction is because that's something that I've been struggling with. I don't think that in the past I've had a lot of issues with, I, um, I struggle with using the term cis because it's been a real issue about calling people cis. So I say non-trans, um, but it's been an issue with saying cis, you know, and so um, I just, you know, like it spills over into actual spaces and then there's tension and we got to heal collectively and we got to, you know, have a woo moment and we can't get to the issues because we have to deal with trauma that's being brought on by this intentional design to keep us divided so that we can't come together collectively and realize that it's not even a democracy, it's a republic. 
<laughs> but let, but that's a whole. I'm not gonna get on my soapbox. Um, yeah, I, I just I I want us to give each other grace, and I want us to be present and remember that we're the trans can. each other so i don't think that we should be treated special or treated like we helpless but i just want to offer that to the space you know um if you encounter some tension you know just just have that in the back of your mind a lot of my sisters a lot of my siblings in the trans community we be on that internet and we be on that internet hard and that trauma from the internet follows us into spaces and it can cause us to become more isolated. It can cause us to be more standoffish because the internet is real, you know, for a lot of us. I navigate actual spaces and I also navigate the internet. So I have a bit of a better balance, but the younger generation spend more time on the internet than anything. So, you know, I just want to name that when we're trying to build collectively so we can understand and give each other grace. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. So I, I don't really, you know, this conversation could go on and on. I'm just really grateful. Max didn't know that he started something when he asked me to do a presentation in 2016 that made me really dig deep. And it started this journey of, 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 of developing a racial justice analysis, understanding root causes. You don't have to know it all, y'all. Get the declaration, download it, take it into your meeting. Say, how can we live up to some of this? We ain't got to do it all. What can we do? You know, how how can we use language that is is supportive? How do we give each other grace? If I make a mistake and use the wrong pronoun, all I say is I'm sorry and the person corrects me or I correct my, my, myself. But how can we bring some of that into the meetings that you were existing in? How, you can just ask, you all kept showing data, but there's no trans data. Start asking the question, make them include a slide. We ain't got our act together yet, so we still have no trans data. That's what I would say the slide just say, because either make, get the data, stop using it as excuse, or, you know, to be invisible is to be violated. You know, show, ask the question. We are here for all our communities. When we win, when everyone wins, we all win. And the least of us needs the most. And so I want you all to think about equity in your uh, conversations versus equality. Is it fair? Don't mean me and you can all go in the same door, but if you are differently able or if they're transphobic and their access ain't equal, that's about equity. So talk about equity, get those declarations of liberation, bring up these definitions. If you see data up there for, for transfer for all of us and it doesn't have another slide that says, let me give you the context for the data, start asking for it, make it yourself. Some bullet points of why the data. Data without context is violence, y'all. So I, I really encourage y'all to ask questions, to dig deep, don't accept the, the narrative, change it. Um, you all have the power and just start talking the talk. You don't have to know it all. You know enough, I guarantee you. So that's all I got. Amazing. Thank you so much, Benita and Max. I know we're out of time. Um, so I'm going to give... a Let's all give Max and Benita their flowers and a big round of applause. You can come on up to you and, um, you know, cheer Whoa. and thank them. And I just wanted to say thank you. Icons, icons, icons. Stands across the board. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and I am going to be parakeeting that data without context is violence. And if they don't yes. know what that means, they yes. get it without the story is violence. Give them Absolutely. a story. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I really enjoyed your presentation. I did a great job. Thank you for the framework that we were about to do. Amazing. Yes. I, I second that, Kenya. Thank you both so much. All right. Um, for folks, for PWN fellows, really quickly and agency advocates, join us next week. 
um, on part two of this uh, frameworks, key frameworks for conducting advocacy on gender justice and reproductive justice. This is just the beginning. Um, and so join us this time next week um, for a training. We'll have Cecilia from um, the Transgender Law Center joining us. Um, and we're just so excited for that. So thanks so much, y'all. And um, have a good and safe rest of your day. Thank you. I enjoy. Bye. Bye. Bye, y'all. Thanks so Have much. Have a good Bye. evening, everyone. Bye.